Hey, thanks for joining us today on Uptime Logistics, powered by Cap Logistics. I am your host, Doug Draper, with the Denver Transportation Club. I'm excited for today's guest. It is Brian Kilcourse with RSR Research. Uh, so, Brian, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Doug. I like to be here. It's a great topic to talk about today, so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Speaking of topics, let's let our audience know what we're going to be getting into today. And it's really about RFID, um, kind of how that uh, improves in inventory visibility and really kind of unlocking the omni-channel um, supply chain. So uh, we're going to learn about RFID, the pros, the cons, the good and the bad. So again, appreciate you. Before we jump in, we like to learn a little bit about our, our guests. So if you wouldn't mind spending a minute or two and introducing yourself, kind of give us some background on your history and for sure a little bit about your business. Well, sure. Thanks for asking. Well, I'm, um, I'm one of the managing partners at RSR Research, and we're a small research firm that studies the business use cases that drive adoption of technology in research. So we don't really focus on the technologies per se. We focus on why business people use them or perhaps why they don't use them, even though they should. Uh, my background is I've been in IT. Uh, I've been in IT since the mid '70s. So I'm one of those guys that could probably answer the ad looking for COBOL programmers. I'm <laughs> one of those people. Um, I got involved in IT back in the days when all you had to do was express interest. But very early on, I became uh, uh, an employee at a company called Long's Drug Stores, which was a five billion dollar chain on the West Coast and in Hawaii. And I spent 20 years there. I, um, I just by uh, the luck of the draw, I think I became the project manager of their very first in-store system, and that led to supply chain. That led to more in-store systems, more supply chain, e-commerce. I ended up being the CIO there for 10 years, and had a good run. Uh, left in about 2002, and I advised venture-funded startups in the Silicon Valley area for a few years, and one of those companies was an RFID company. So that's where I got my introduction to RFID. Around 2005, I became the CEO of a B2B, a B2B business that uh, focused on retail technologies. And it was while there in 2007 that we developed a research division that we eventually bought out and started as RSR Research. And that's my story, that brings, brings me right up to date. Nice. That's terrific. I appreciate that. So we have a pretty uh, well-educated audience, um, but I do like to kind of start with some basics, um, maybe some key terminology that we'll be referring to in today. So everybody's heard kind of RFID. Um, so really two of them would be, you know, let's dive into what, what exactly that means and maybe some traditional applications from back in your COBOL um, programming days. And, and then maybe a quick um, summary of what omni-channel supply chain means. Those are terms people use and kind of know, but let's just get a refresher course if you don't mind. Sure. Well, of course, RFID means radio frequency identifier, and um, they've actually been around since uh, just after World War II. The military used them to identify um, physical assets, and uh, they were used in these special purposes ways for many, many years. But starting in the late 1990s, people started thinking about our, an, a cheap RFID chip that was reflective rather than active, meaning it didn't have power of its own, but reflected back power mm -hmm. that was uh, generated by some other source. And this was used essentially to license plate things. Now, this is a precursor to what we think of today as the Internet of Things, but it's an important concept to get across. The idea being that if you can identify a physical thing in the digital space, you can now do things with that. For example, you can analyze the data. You can track its movement. You can do those kinds of things. Um, in 2005, uh, Walmart mandated use of the RFID chip to identify case pack and pallets from the outbound dock of a, DC, of, of a manufacturer to the in, inbound dock of their DC. And that was a big deal. And uh, I think the reason it was a big deal was because, first of all, Walmart was doing it. Let's, let's, let's not mince words there. But the other thing was it created essentially the Petri dish for a lot of the bugs to get worked out of it. Now, at the time, most retailers were pretty skeptical of that whole idea because, in fact, there, there, is, a, um, there is a code that can be used. It's called 128. Uh, which is basically a, um, a, um, a barcode that can be used to identify a case pack or a pallet or something like that. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, it was important for the industry because we could start now working on 
some of the challenges that we had, some of the physics challenges, for example, being able to get a signal through liquids or metals or those kinds of things. The other thing uh, was because Walmart was the one that was pushing it, is there was this really hard push to lower the overall cost of the implementations. And this is still ongoing today. This is still one of the biggest problems with RFID. So that's the first thing to think about. The, the, your next question is, what is it good for? You know, what can we do with it? And I guess that's what we'll yeah. talk about as we go forward. Yeah. No, I appreciate you bringing up the Walmart scenario because I remember that was um, <clears throat> pretty cutting edge and um, disruptive, if you will, with a lot of different... Uh, supply yeah. chains and was it just too cutting edge was it the fact that the vendors weren't at this at the level they needed to be to fully implement it like what, tell me more about that why 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 did it kind of falter well there were a lot of problems with it first of all the cost wasn't optimized and, and walmart is always interested in lowering the cost of anything they 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 want to do they had a particular problem and the problem that they were trying to solve was this visibility in the supply chain, as I said, from the outbound dock of the manufacturer's DC to the inbound dock of their DC. Mm -hmm. they, wanted to track, they wanted to track inventory as it moved through the pipe. Most retailers felt, and I was one of them, that the biggest problem was between the back of the store and the front of the store. And knowing where the inventory was once it was in the box. And in fact, I think it was in 2009, that the University of Arkansas study said, yes, that's exactly where the issue is. It's between the, it's from the, the storeroom in the back of the store and getting it to the front where it can be sold to, to customers. And that brought up the whole issue of, of real-time visibility of inventory at the store SKU level. And that's a huge subject that relates to your question about omni-channel. Um, and we can talk about that certainly in a minute. But the challenges they had was it wasn't optimized for cost, pretty cutting edge, and from the technical perspective, and perhaps not quite the right use case. So I think all those things played into causing a pretty big delay in the implementation of RFID. Yeah, yeah. Good. Well, thanks for that explanation. I appreciate it. So tell me why it's so, uh, why is the RFID such a nice fit for retail? You know, you've talked about, hey, let's put it on a pallet and let's, we know where the pallet is, but it seems more and more the, the entity and the, and the vertical it's embraced it more has been been retail. So why is that? Well, it's at the store SKU level that the, the issue is, is really important. Um, um, fashion merchants in particular have been able to take advantage of RFID at the item level. They want to know where something is. So let's imagine uh, you're like me and you every year you buy four or five pairs of Levi's. It's always the same. It's always the same style. It's always the same fit. And you go, if you go to a Macy's, for example, you, you'll see a stack of Levi's and you have to plow through them to find the size that's right for you. Or a system could tell you where that size is. And one of the problems with doing it the traditional way is you might see a whole row of stacks of Levi's and you know that somewhere in there <laughs> is your size, but you're not sure it's going to be in the right place. And, and in fact, uh, more often than not, it's in the wrong place. So this gets to the whole issue of, of things that look alike to the human eye but are not alike, and you need to be able to see what your inventory position really is. Another common problem is you may say, for example, Ever-Ready batteries. You have a kiosk that has Ever-Ready Ever batteries in aisle 14, and you have another kiosk that has a battery uh, kiosk uh, in aisle 27. So how many Ever-Ready batteries do you have in your store? That's just classic problems. When should you replenish? Where should you replenish? Those kinds of things. What's happened with Omnichannel is, is the, the traditional notion of starting your browse in the store as a consumer has been disrupted. We now begin our browse in the digital space. And so retailers have this responsibility to be able to expose their inventory to customers so that they can commit to sell it and consumers can commit to buy it. Now, if you don't know exactly how much inventory you have or where it is, then how do you make that commitment? Well, you have three choices. Uh, one of them is you can over inventory everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, just remember that inventory is money in a carbon-based format that loses its <laughs> right. value very, very quickly. So that's not feasible. The other one is you can risk disappointing your customers. And we've all experienced that. I'm sure you've experienced that in your own per personal shopping experiences where it says, yeah, we have five of these in store and you go to the store to pick it up and only to discover that they don't. 
And uh, that leaves a very, very bad taste in consumers' mouths. And the third one is you can redline your inventory. You can say, well, you know, if I think I have 10 available, I'm just going to say I'm out of stock because I'm not actually sure. And that's not a great option either because consumers then may not be able to buy something that in fact was there to be sold. So what's the last option? The, the last option and the right option is to make inventory visible across the entire enterprise in something approaching real time with a high degree of accuracy. And this is where Internet of Things comes into play. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to see digitally what you own physically so that you can commit to sell it to a consumer. And that's, it's that simple, but it's a profound problem. Yeah. Have you noticed um, um, retailers be reluctant to give that visibility to the consumer? If I am a store, long Drug, and I have batteries, mm -hmm. it's good information for me right? For me to understand where my stuff is, but I don't know if I want the consumer to know where my stuff is because it could potentially pull back the sheets and expose some liabilities or problems. So what, is it still more interest centric, if that's even the right word, or are retailers giving more visibility to the consumer? Retailers know that they need to provide visibility to the consumer because some of their biggest competitors are already doing it. So Amazon does it, Walmart does it, Target does it. These are highly credible technologists as, as well as being great retailers. And they've essentially upped the ante so significantly that the, the barriers to compete are now, are now very high. Mm -hmm. And retailers, I think, have gotten over any, any reluctance they might have had to expose inventory to consumers. The real challenge is what are you exposing? Are you expo exposing dirty data, incomplete data, wrong data or are you exposing the right the right data mm -hmm. and and that's a huge challenge because of the way we implemented inventory control systems in the 80s and the 90s and this is my generation of technologists remember that the networks weren't very good i joke when i give speeches that there was this thing called the baud rate that some people don't even remember now but <laughs> it was very very slow dial up networks and so we distributed our operational systems out to the stores we put servers in the stores and once a day, we would update, for example, a stock ledger in the central enterprise uh, data center. Mm -hmm. But basically, the inventory was offline. That was okay as long as two things happened. As long as the shopping journey began in the store and ended in the store, that was okay. And the other one was that, uh, that uh, consumers didn't hop stores that often. In truth, they don't. But in now, in today's world, consumers, be, they, they interact with the enterprise. They don't inter interact with the store. Now, they might go to store A to pick something up on their way to work, and they might go to store B after work, or they might order something to be collected at store A that is only available in store B, and it has to be shipped across. All of these things are more complex than before. So the important thing to remember is that in the old supply chain, in the old retail selling model as well, it was a one-to-end relationship, one distribution center out to many, many stores. Now we have an end-to-end -end relationship, number of touch points coming in, and number of touch points coming out. And as any data, uh, database analyst will tell you, an end-to-end -end relationship is intrinsically more difficult than a one-to-end relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the term uh, relationship with the enterprise because you're right. Whenever you said that, it just kind of, it's exactly right. Right. The store is a physical structure. I go to pick up what I purchase, but my engagement is, is digital. So I completely understand. Yeah, that. think about it this way. You know, in, in the store was central to the retail environment in the past. It's where everything happened. So everything was focused on getting inventory to the store and then getting into the hands of consumers. Now the, now the store is nodal to an enterprise selling environment. And the selling environment is digital. It's not physical, it's digital. Right. Now, the store is a node to that and, and can be both a supplier or, and it can also be a fulfillment point. And sometimes it's doing both at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. So this next question is kind of like, how much does it cost to, uh, to buy a car? Because then you got like, well, what kind of car do you want? Yeah. If I was a retailer and I wanted to um, implement RFID across my supply chain, yeah. Like, what are one or two things that you need to start with? And then how much are we talking about financially? You know, and, and maybe there's some small price points or inner points, 
But are you, do you have to be this multinational billion dollar company to gain the advantages to implement RFID? That's a handful of questions I just threw at you so you can answer them as you see fit. Boy, what fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, let's start with the chip itself. The, the RFID chip has, has gotten dramatically less expensive than it was in 2005 when the Walmart mandate happened. And that, of course, is driven mostly by volume. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also driven by standards. There are organizations like the RAIN Standards Group up in Seattle that's trying to, 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 to create standards that have two impacts. The first is it makes it a little easier to implement. Standards are good that way, but it also it impacts the cost of manufacture. If you're dealing all dealing with the same set of standards, you can deal with it there. The other, the other big challenge for retailers is reader technology. Um, now, reader technology is, not, is actually the bigger expense. Chips are expensive because there are so many millions of them or billions of them, but the reader technology is complex. And when I'm talking about reader technology, it's something that you know, sends a signal out and, ref and gets reflected back by the chip and says, that's my cup of coffee or that's my iPad or whatever mm -hmm. it is that I'm looking at. Um, there's been a lot of improvement in what they're calling fixed position readers that can actually uh, read over a wide physical space. Um, it's still quite expensive, and it, but it's getting cheaper because those technologies are improving. The one that most retailers are using, for example, Lululemon, who has been kind of a poster child for RFID implementation, is using um, mobile readers that you know, look like devices you hold in your hand and walk up and down an aisle. You've probably also seen uh, pictures of the robots that are being used in Walmart to, to go up and down the aisles. They're actually, yeah. they're actually yeah. reading. So... These aren't cheap, uh, but they're getting cheaper. Uh, now, the other thing that I always point out to people is don't forget the elephant in the room is that your network has to be uh, capable of handling that much traffic. And there was a debate some years ago about where all of this um, uh, uh, raw data should be filtered. Should it be filtered at the edge or it should be filtered up at the central host in some big giant machine that churns it out and says, that's garbage, but that's real. That's garbage and that's real. Here's the example I'm talking about. Here's my cup of coffee, Pete's coffee. This is a good Bay Area coffee. All right. now, do I care that I moved it from here to here? I don't care, right? What we care about is that I have it. <laughs> now, if, it's, if I just put it over there, that might be important for some reason. So some of that is noise and some of that is real data. Where should it get filtered? Um, and the Nowadays, the, the good news is that you can actually put um, AI, um, AI um, uh, algorithms right at the edge where the, where the raw data is collected to say this is real and this is not something I should care about. Gotcha. So um, let's talk about re the ROI, return on investment, right? So okay. you've just been tasked um, by senior leadership to go out and you have this phenomenal You've done your research, you've done your homework, you feel good about your job, and you say, okay, we need to spend $25 million to uh, get up and running in the modern day and age. What, yeah. what tangible things, and the return on investment is six months out, two years out, and then what is the metric they measure? Is it the fact that they're selling more? Is it the fact they have less inventory? Like, what is the return on investment time-wise, and what are they actually measuring? So that's a tough question, too. You're asking some really tough questions. So I'll, I'll answer this kind of subjectively without getting down to the hard dollars. The ROI that was, that was first pitched was fairly compelling, but it couldn't cover the cost of the implementation. And that was the reduction in the amount of time it took to do a physical inventory. Mm -hmm. now, I'm sure if you think about it a little bit, you know that retailers periodically have to essentially count everything in their enterprise. And they do it for a bunch of reasons. One of them is to true up their, their ledger and the other is to true up their stock position. So they understand where they really have compared to what they thought they had by adding up all the receipts and all the sales. Um, that's an expensive process. And there's no evidence from my personal experience, and I've talked to my partners about this, that that's actually all that accurate. Because of you, what you typically do is you hire armies of temporary workers to come in and count all your stuff. Yeah. Uh, far less than accurate. Um, so, but, and it's expensive, but it's not as expensive as implementing RFID across the enterprise. So that was kind of a push. It's been a very hard sell. Gotcha. My sense is that the real value of this, and I, I think that the numbers would probably be huge. Uh, that's, you know, broad term, but it's in your investment of inventory. Remember what inventory is. It's money. 
and it's invested into these physical things. And to the extent that you're insecure about how much inventory you actually have to sell, it, it will affect how much inventory you have um, on hand. And the tendency is to over inventory. So one of the classic problems that retailers have is they have too much of the wrong stuff and not enough of the right stuff. It's a perennial problem. And it, first of all, it's money. It's money that's devaluating very quickly. Secondarily, mm-hmm. it's costing them sales. Now, remember what happens to too much of the wrong kind of stuff. What retailers do with that is they mark it down. And another way to think of a markdown is you're just giving away margin. You're just getting rid of the stuff. And finally, you close the inventory out and, you, and you're done with it. But you've lost money by that point. So there's, there's first of all, the overinvestment of inventory. There's having to mark down inventory that's not selling fast enough. And there's, and there's the other problem of not having inventory in the right places where you could sell it. So all of those problems, at least theoretically, could be solved by better visibility. And I, I believe that to be true. Now let's talk about one other thing. And this gets back to what you can do with the digital representation of a physical thing. You can now analyze it. And you can now decide where's the best place to put that inventory in the first place where it's most likely to sell. And retailers have been thinking about this for some time. They'll characterize this as a localization of the assortment. Now, the value of the localization of the assortment, theoretically, is that you'd have much higher service levels to customers at a, at a much lower investment rate. So essentially, the inventory that you do invest in is much, much more um, effective in delivering a profit to your bottom line. Mm-hmm. Now, that's more theory than reality. Most, most retailers cluster stores based on size and some uh, demographics, some geolocation data to, to localize assortment to some extent. But if you could truly localize it based on how it was going to actually sell to a, um, let's call it a hyper-local market of consumers, it's in theory anyway the best case. My contention is you cannot do that if you can't analyze it using the latest in analytical engines, AI and ML, and you can't do that unless you can have a digital representation of the inventory, which brings you right back to RFID, right, <laughs> right back to the, to the, to the yeah. subject. Very cool. Well, you know, you, I was just thinking, you already answered kind of my next thought, thought process is everybody's, what's in it for me, right? So we talked about some of the benefit with the, with the retailer, Right. And like, okay, why should I care as the consumer? But I think you just answered it by saying, I can quickly know what I want, where I want it, when I want it there. And giving that visibility, the, the retailer can say, we need X number of these in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and X number of these in the Bay Area. Is yeah. that one of the benefits that the consumer has? And is there any other ones? That's a, it's, a perfect, it's a perfect example of, or a description of what it is that, that is going on or could go on in this world. Because consumers do the investigations in the digital space, we, we look for the right solution, we make our selection, sometimes we even pay for it, and we arrange to pick it up. Consumers are not interested in wasting time in a big box store, wandering around looking for stuff. And their time is valuable. Uh, and because they've done all the work, they want to get right to solution. Mm-hmm. So now there's two versions of right to solution. So for example, you could just do a buy online pickup and store a la Walmart or Kroger or one of those companies, and you can drive up to this area and pick up your order and leave. And that's nice and efficient, but it takes away one of the really fun parts of shopping for consumers and one of the really valuable activities for retailers. And that's that we know as retailers that the longer a consumer is in the store, the more they're going to buy. We know that. Mm-hmm. And we also know it's, it's one of these dynamics that as old as the industry that after consumers have got done buying the things they thought they were going to buy, they become much less price sensitive. And so the margin percentage of the basket tends to go up the longer they're in a box. Mm-hmm. So, so let's deal with the things we know they want to deal with by getting them right to solution and then encourage them to spend a little bit more time and entertain themselves inside the store. There's a lot of value in that. Yeah. Um, but consumers don't want what they don't want. That's very, very clear. Let me give you a more real um, current example. I was talking to, a, to a, um, uh, an executive from a company called Shortest Path. And, uh, and Shortest Path is an AI as a service solution. And they've come up with something that they're calling the COVID disruption index. Uh, and they can measure the, uh, essentially the movement of the COVID virus 
COVID-19 virus through America down to a, to a zip code basis. And they update their models daily. It's basically a number. Think of it as a lift or a drag number. You know, one being even, 1.1 being a higher risk, 0.9 being a lower risk. And, they, and then they project out seven and 14 days forward. Now, why is that interesting? That's interesting because if you can marry that to what you know about your forecast and about your inventory, you can move inventory to those places that are most likely to need it. So, for example, you need certain types of medicines or certain type of protective gear, or maybe you know that you're not going to sell it because the COVID virus is is moving through an area where the demand is going to drop off very suddenly. Mm -hmm. It's a real joke about toilet paper, right? (laughs) But if if you can see that demand is going nuts in one area because there's a COVID scare going on, you you have an opportunity to move inventory to the right place. It's all predicated on, on one notion, though, that's really important. You have to be able to know where your inventory is. Brings us right back to RFID. Yeah, interesting. Well, right now we're talking with Brian Kilcourse. He's the managing partner at RSR Research, and we're having a phenomenal conversation about RFID and all the things that, did, not unintended consequences, but things that uh, continue to support the, the, the need and how that continues to grow. So one thing I want to jump in is let's talk about returns. Yeah. All right. That's one thing that, you know, regardless of um, the vertical, return management in the e-commerce environment is becoming more and more important, more and more challenging and more and more expensive. Um, what are your thoughts and what can RFID do to uh, help bridge that gap and make it more effective for the retailer and the consumer? Returns. What a mess. <laughs> <laughs> this well, calls officially over, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a mess, no matter how you cut it. And and as the volume of, of direct-to-consumer shipments uh, increases, so do returns. Mm-hmm. And some retailers in the fashion uh, in the fashion vertical are talking about thirty percent return rates and higher. This is just obscene. I think what's happening with with returns. Um, I've watched my daughters do this. They'll get online and they'll, they, they, they see something that they want, a fashion that they want. They'll order three. They'll order one size down, one size up, and the size that they think they are. And one of the problems with, with that the industry has as a whole is when is a size five really a size five? That's another issue. RFID right. is not going to solve that. Um, but the other problem is, is that you've now taken two of the, you've taken two garments out of circulation that could be sold to somebody else. So that's a huge issue. RFID, it, it gets back down to the basic visibility thing. Most retailers want to be able to take a return in a store, regardless of how the customer got it in the first place. So there's that, there's that issue that you need to think about. And visibility is the key to getting that started. I was doing a little bit of research this morning about, about one of, and I'm going to look down and read it because I don't have it memorized. But um, um, for example, the, the RAIN RFID standard that I mentioned earlier is coming up with new capabilities to tag chips that, that can essentially be used for loss prevention purposes, but it gets turned off from a consumer perspective. So, for example, when it leaves, it essentially becomes inactive. But at a certain point, it can be reactivated uh, so that you can now begin to see it. And if you can see it, you can process it again. So, again, it gets down to visibility. As far as that going to make returns uh, less? No. (laughs) It's going to allow you to be able to do what you need to do, um, whatever that is. And you have a number of choices. You can triage the the return to either send it back to a DC or to put it back in stock in the store if it happens to be the assortment or to do something else with it, you know, yeah. but, uh, but again, it's all down to visibility. Yeah. Well, when you mix the word triage and the supply chain, you know, that's problematic. <laughs> <laughs> well, know? the golden rule of supply chain is the same as when I was an IT or, and that's that the whole objective of it is to touch the inventory as little as possible. Right. Yeah. Um, every time you touch inventory, you're adding cost to it and you're taking away margin. Yeah. So this notion of touching it several times to get it from point A to point B to point C to point D to the consumer and back to point C again, you're just killing yourself. And um, now there are other issues there that we're not talking about today, but how do you make sure that that consumer doesn't buy a size three, a size five, and a size seven? How do you know that the size five that they're thinking they're buying is the right size? Mm, yeah. And there are technologies that are helping or are moving, moving that direction to give consumers a greater 
level of confidence that they're getting what they think they're getting. But that's another discussion for another day. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah. So um, a couple of things before we uh, before we wrap up here. I always like to say, all right, let's do a, a vision quest, right? Let's do some some mega trends. There was a book written years and years ago about that. So give us a perspective of, of RFID technology five years out. And you alluded to it a little bit there with your size three, five, and seven. But what, what do you see coming down the road, um, like I said, five, seven years out that would continue to help retailers and the consumer? You know, it's interesting. I, I, I don't believe that RFID is going to solve all of the problems. There are some physics issues that the, the, the people in the know will tell you about are almost insurmountable. And because of the nature of the technology, they're not going to get solved. But RFID in combination with other technologies, for example, video analytics, um, can give us that 100% visibility that we need. I really believe this notion of the digital twin is where we need to go. Um, so, for example, in, in today's world, uh, retailers are attacking inventory accuracy and visibility in fairly traditional ways. They're looking at their existing operational systems and they're trying to plug holes and they're trying to update more regularly. And they're doing these are all valuable things. But ultimately, what we need to be able to do is be able to see things in near real time with 100 percent accuracy. And when I mean near, near real time, I mean real time, just like a stock market or your bank account, not an hour from now or a day from now. And, mm -hmm. uh, in five years, I hope that we're there. Uh, because when you think about it from a money perspective, after buildings and things like that, the biggest investment that any retailer is ever going to make is they're in, in their inventory. Yeah. It's a huge sum of money. Go back to macroeconomics for just a second. When you just do the math at the biggest, at the highest level, the inventory across the globe turns about three times, just three times. That tells me that there's a whole lot of excess inventory throughout the entire chain, just dealing with the fact that we can't see it. Mm -hmm. Should be much better than that. Yeah, very interesting. So one final um, uh, note or piece of advice, right? If you were a, a retailer that was looking to get into this, yep. um, what's one or two things to say, don't forget about this or absolutely do not go down this road. Um, what, what would be one, maybe two things that you would share? If you haven't already done it, start a, a, a skunk work lab to understand the technology. Number one. Um, number two, you have to deal. You have to deal ultimately with the data. And this is moving away from thinking of it functionally and thinking of it as a valuable piece of data in a data-driven enterprise. So now that sounds trite. You know, something a CIO might say. We got to move to a data-driven enterprise. But right. in fact, that's data. Data is, is interesting because it, it, at the big level, it doesn't change very much, but how you use it changes all the time. So understand data, understand its attributes, understand its, 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 its timeliness, how long you have to have it, how complete it needs to be, who needs to see it. What we used to call the crate retrieve update, delete logic behind any data. Start mm -hmm. focusing on your enterprise data um, model, if you will. I know it's called something different nowadays. And, uh, and don't worry too much about the functionality. Just start testing. Yeah. Now, the, the big mistake that you can make is you think it's close enough, and then you roll it out to a district only to discover that you've tied your thumbs together. Don't do that. I think that's a great, great piece of advice for sure. Don't, don't, uh, don't think you got it and roll it out, and then there's, then there's problems. Then you're in reactive mode, and nobody wants that. So. Well, once, you, once you're in the real world, your focus will go toward keeping the real world alive, even if it doesn't deserve to be alive. So. Yeah. Make sure you got it right before you get out and go out to real stores. One final piece of advice I'd say sure. is don't, don't try to make RFID the solution that solves all problems. It won't. It's, it's a really good technology. It's not the only one, but you have to think of it in the context of the digital twin. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, Brian, I can't thank you enough for joining us today on Uptime Logistics. We've learned quite a bit about RFID and how that's really impacting the retail supply chain. So I want to thank you again for participating today. Thank you very much. It's a fun topic, obviously. I really love this stuff. So yeah. thank you for asking me questions. Absolutely. And I'd like to thank uh, our audience for joining us today on Uptime Logistics. Of course, it's powered by Cap Logistics. You can find more information about the show at the description below. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. And please visit caplogistics.com today. They'll customize your transportation solutions. Thanks a lot.